Julian, thank you very much for those, uh, those kind words. I should, I should warn you that there's uh, two very senior UCL academics in the audience, so you've got to be a bit careful about uh, what, you, uh, what you say. But uh, we start with a, a little bit of setting the scene. See, the audio worked every time we tried it before, and now it doesn't. I blame the AV people for this. I don't quite understand why that's not working. They've probably hit mute. I'd say that's the best I've got, um, but since the sound didn't work then, I uh, can't really do much about that. So let's completely change tack and start to think about what I'm going to talk about today. Um, obviously, it's an inaugural lecture. It's supposed to be uh, a little bit about the work that I've, mostly about the work that I've done in my, in my career, I guess, both academic and commercial. But mostly, really, what I want to talk about is the, what drives the work we do in this area, the, um, the concept of biochemical engineering, what it is, um, what's important about it, uh, why we do it, and then go on a little bit, I guess, to give a couple of examples. It's quite hard to set content for an inaugural lecture. You don't know what the audience is going to be like. Um, most of us have been in the academic world or the commercial world for quite a few years. In my case, pretty much 20 now. So. There's an awful lot of stuff that we've done, and it's never all going to fit into a lecture. But um, in my case, I'm lucky that I can take an example from right at the start of my academic career and something from right at the end and try and tie them together in a story. So in terms of what the purpose of um, biochemical engineering, particularly applied to healthcare, is, we're looking at starting off with Simple question is, what do people need to survive? So the four pretty fundamental things you need to survive, food, water, fuel, and shelter. Interestingly enough, all of those are driven by engineering. Food, water, chemical engineering, shelter, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, fuel, chemical engineering, petroleum engineering, however you want to think about it. All the engineering disciplines represented in the fundamentals that we need to survive. But it might not be quite as simple as that. Okay. We are watching a pretty significant explosion of population in the world. 1957, global population was about 2.8 billion. This year, it's 7.5. Okay, that's really, really quite significant. Fastest period of growth in the Earth's history. And the global population is getting a lot older. Uh, the areas where... 30% or more of the population are going to be over 60 years old by 2050, growing considerably. Okay? So the question is, what's changed, particularly in the last 100 years, that's made the population grow so fast and the, the population age shift? This is global population from 1800 to 2000. And some interesting medical uh, treatment, if you like, uh, factors put onto it. So the development of certain vaccines coming in, smallpox, Edward Jenner, way back in 1800, moving through some of the uh, vaccines against some of the diseases that were decimating the population back in, back in those, those periods. So cholera, bubonic plague, typhoid, tuberculosis. But the big one, the big green arrow, first time commercial manufactured penicillin. First time we commercially manufactured an antibiotic, so we made something that could halt bacterial infections. And just after that, population starts to skyrocket. So the actual question, what do people need to survive? Water, shelter, food, fuel, medicine. Right? And medicine is where biochemical engineering comes in. So questions that are, some, some people may ask, some people may not, but certainly I'm asking as part of this lecture, what does it take to make a drug? If you want to make a drug to treat a disease, 
how do you get from nothing to the point whereby you've got this drug available to all of the population? Isn't it really just smart biologists, smart chemists? A lot of it is smart biologists and smart chemists. Um, engineers are quite lucky in that we get to play with really bright people in specialist fields because we can just kind of, you know, try and apply our knowledge to areas where people have spent um, an immense amount of brain power, an immense amount of effort trying to solve certain problems, trying to get over the first hurdle, and then our objective is to come along and try and assist after that. What has engineering got anything to do with it? Okay, if so, if you can, if you can develop, if you're smart biologists, you're smart chemists, you're smart clinicians, probably shouldn't leave them out. If they can go and they can develop a drug in a lab, okay, why can't we just, why don't we just give that to, to people? That'll be much quicker, that'll be much less hassle. Um, it's just a pill, how hard is making it going to be? Okay, the answer is very, very, very hard. The challenge is, development of a drug through to manufacture. So the challenge is taking somebody's brilliant, bright idea and then getting it to the point whereby you can make it at large scale. That's how I view biochemical engineering, although obviously it doesn't just apply to, to therapeutics, it applies to uh, other areas as well, but from the point of view of this talk, we're talking about medicine. Um, Wikipedia defies defines biochemical engineering as branch of chemical engineering that mainly deals with the design and construction of unit processes that involve biological organisms or molecules. Desperately dull definition, but it pretty much covers it. It's just probably got too many words in it. Okay, what we do is we apply process engineering, chemical engineering knowledge to biological problems. Um, it's great fun because you don't have to deal with um, horrible extremes of temperature and pressure like you do in chemical engineering. So you do get to avoid things like thermodynamics, which I'm sure some of the undergraduates in the audience would be quite happy about. Um, okay. It's a cell. Biochemical engineering, in terms of medicine, in terms of products, that's our factory. That makes what we want it to make. We might come along and take uh, a bacterial cell, say, introduce some DNA from humans into that cell in the form of a plasmid, convince that cell by either giving it nice things like sugar or poking it aggressively with sticks to make it make, say, human protein. Or we might use an animal cell to do that. It depends on what we're trying to achieve. To a biologist, that's, you know, the sort of detail of a cell. Okay, to a biochemical engineer, it's that. <laughs> All right? Stuff goes in, other stuff comes out, stuff we don't want, stuff we do want, right? The problem with that approach is that it fails to allow for an awful lot of the intricacies of biology, which is why we have to work with biologists. The advantage of this approach is that it, you don't have to worry about some of the intricacies of biology, which means that you can progress some things quicker, but you can get things badly wrong, and there's been plenty of examples, particularly in medicine development, where people have got things badly wrong about failing to understand the intricacies of biology, the intricacies of chemistry. Thalidomide was a drug um, that probably uh, many people in this audience never w were aware of being used, but it was a simple chemical error that caused that simple failure to understand that the fact that two different forms of a molecule that bent light one direction and the other could make such a huge difference to treating somebody or causing um, all sorts of birth defects. So, you can't just do this, but it helps if you can do this occasionally. So, why do we need engineering when we're developing drugs? Okay, so let's, let's go through a really, really simplistic development of a drug. I apologize to anybody who is experienced in drug development in the audience, because this is going to be massively simplistic, but you, know, um, you can call me out on it afterwards if you like. So, biologist or a clinician or a chemist, biochemist develops, they have an idea, they go, hang on a second, I wonder, this, this, this molecule, this might be able to treat this because of this idea I've got. So they, they start to look around, start to play around in their labs, and they start to make the drug. And they make enough of this to see if it will work, just to see if it might work on what they're trying to treat. When you made enough to see, just to check whether it might work, you're going to carry out some tests. I'm afraid you do usually carry those out on animals. It's not usually ethical to just shove it straight into humans, or in some cases it's done. So you carry out some small-scale tests, you start to see hey, this drug is amazing, it's, you know, it's, 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 
causing uh, reduction in this disease, reduction in this cancer, whatever, in loads and loads of cases. So, what do you do now? You've got to that point, you've got some evidence that your drug works, but how are you going to make it? How are you going to, how are you going to get to the next stage? How are you going to get to that final point where what you're hoping for is realized, which is that you've got this drug available to the general public? So if the drug shows that it might work, or it looks like it will work, you're going to need to do some in-depth human trials. Um, the things that we usually look to trial in, 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 in drug trials, toxicity, obviously, is it actually harmful? Dose response, what happens if we give it in different doses? Does it get more effective? Is there a point where there's too much? Is there a point where too much of it makes it toxic? Is there a point where the side effects overwhelm the advantages? Um, The other point you would look at is what's called efficacy. So efficacy is actually, does it work at all? Right? Is, it, is it any use? It might have worked in mice. Is it any good in humans? So we're going to do this. We're going to have to make more of it. If we want to try it in humans, the scale of human trials goes up, so we need to start making more of it. So we can't make it in the lab anymore in the way that we did before. We can't make it in small tubes. We can't make it in little flasks. Maybe we'll get away with making it in some smaller scale uh, vessels, the uh, vessel there with a question mark on it is about five litres in scale, but more likely we're going to have to go and make it in a great big stainless steel tank, probably. Okay? And we're getting into that's full on process engineering. Okay? Um, second problem, the really big one, yeah, just making more of it is one thing, but we really, really need to be nervous really concerned about the quality of the drug, the reproducibility of the drug, the purity of the drug. All drugs are complicated, but biologically made drugs are more complicated than, than, than most. They can be quite heterogeneous, by which I mean you could make an awful lot of it the same way, and some of it will come out slightly different, or even quite a lot different. And it might be quite difficult to judge the different things from each other. And from the example before, from thalidomide, thalidomide wasn't a biological drug, but clearly heterogeneity in, in thalidomide was a major problem. We need to make sure that we only administer the drug we want. If we're using a cell as a factory to make a drug, it's not just going to make that. It's going to make all the other stuff that it wanted to make as well. So what comes out at the end is not going to be just the drug. It will be the drug and other things. So we need to be really careful about what we're setting out to give. We obviously need to be sure it's safe as well as, as well as that it works. It's no good if it works, if it also works and treats one thing and then injures people in another way. Because, coming back to the first one, biological drugs are really complicated, it's not possible or viable to test every single property of the drug every time you make it. So you can't just go, every time you make a load of drug, I, I'm going to analyse every aspect of this before I release it to the public. It's not possible to do that. So what happens is you define the quality of your product by the way you make it. You make your process so utterly and completely reproducible that every time you make it, your product comes out the same. Okay? Um, there's a couple of concepts around that. Um, uh, the, the simplistic name for that is the process is the product. It's also a, a tenant of what's called quality by design. Um, but this is how drug, and particularly biological drug manufacturers, look to ensure that they don't have to do these vast numbers of tests every time, but they still get a safe product. So we need to get to this, this point where we can uh, start to run our tests. So we need to make more of our product. It's really easy before. We just grew some cells up in a flask and we filtered the cells out. And then we, those things are chromat little chromatography columns. We ran the, uh, the liquid once the cells were removed. We ran that down the, uh, the chromatography columns. And all our drugs sticks to the chromatography column. Okay, it just sticks to it, and then we take it off, and then we administer it, and that was easy. That's not a problem. It doesn't really work like that in the real world. I put this, it's this picture in just for um, Professor Dan Bracewell, who's sitting at the back, because this was in a presentation that me and him used to use years ago at UCL. Um, that's a standard process for manufacturing human monoclonal antibody. So uh, uh, human monoclonal antibodies are... Um, uh, they were what used to be known as magic bullets. Um, you can target them to certain parts of the, of, of the human body, of the immune system, so you can use them to carry very toxic uh, treatments in for cancer and things like that. Um, they haven't maybe turned out to be 
as amazing as everyone thought they would be, but there are still some pretty powerful drugs that are monoclonals out there. And what happens is rather than just having oh, a flask and a filter and some columns, in this case, you've got to remove the cells, but you've got to remove the cells at very large scales, so you can't just maybe use a little filter. In this case, we're using a big continuous centrifuge. The yellow boxes are um, diafiltrate, what's called diafiltration systems, so we use them to change the liquid that the product is in. And then the blue boxes are our chromatography columns, so those are the three steps we use to make our product stick to the column, getting purer and purer every time. A couple of other things in there are viral inactivation steps, the red and orange things. And then um, there's a final vialing at the end where it goes into however we're going to administer it to our patients. That's fine. The clicker stopped working there. Okay. That's fine, but every time you run a product through a step, you lose some of it. Nothing out there is 100% efficient, so every time you run a product through a step, you lose some of it. Mm, it's okay, but you've got a constant balance to achieve here. It's a massive trade-off. Yield, purity, and the time, so how fast you can make the drug. You can't have all three of these things. So if you try and make it pure, really pure, you must sacrifice some of the product. So to make it, uh, to hit a certain level of purity, you might need to throw away 50% of the product along the way. Okay? That is fine. I mean, and purity is clearly quite critical, right? We're not going to want to kill anybody. Some of these products are worth hundreds of thousands of pounds a gram. So throwing away too much of it unnecessarily is a bit of an economic disaster. Um, similarly, you don't want to take too long about it. There might be um, uh, concerns about how stable the drug is in the process. So you're constantly trading these things off. Then when you've got that point, you've made all this stuff, you still have to go through phase two, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four clinical trials, although phase four you're on market by that point. Um, Phase one, you look to make sure that the drug isn't going to kill people. Phase two, you generally look for side effects of dose response. Phase three is large-scale efficacy, so large-scale applying the drug to people that suffer from the disease you're trying to treat and um, making sure that hopefully you get the results you want. Okay? The key point about this is the little uh, words in the bottom down there, 10 to 15 years later. Clinical trials take a long time. How long depends on the drug, depends how complicated the trials are, but it's very, very rare to get through clinical trials in less than seven years. Sometimes you can do it for um, what are called end-of-life conditions. So if the, if the thing you're treating was going to cause the person to die anyway, then there are, um, there are moral concerns about um, the slowness of clinical trials and you can move faster. But generally, you're talking about a long period of time, and that's if it works well. I mean, frequently you have to go back and repeat phases. These things take a long time. They cost an absolute fortune, huge amount of money to run clinical trials. And this is where the economics comes into it. You're up against a ticking clock, because when you have that idea way back in the lab, you probably filed a patent on that drug. And that patent's got a certain life to it. 20 years, 25 years, depends on where you patent it. If you're going to have to lose 10 years to your clinical trials, you are already halve the period that you can make any money out of that drug. Now, I know it's not necessarily as simple as that. You can sometimes extend patents, but in general, you're going to hit a wall in 20 years' time when everyone else can just copy your manufacturing process. They didn't have to do all the R&D that you did. They didn't have to do all the development. They didn't have to pay for all the clinical trials. Um, and they didn't even have to pay for the 999 drugs that failed for the one that got to the point where it's at market. So you need to make an awful lot of money in that revenue period to be able to claw back the cost of the development of the drug, claw back all the cost of all the other drugs that didn't work. But somewhere in that other period, you've also got to take your drug from this idea in the lab up to the point where you can make it a large scale for trials. Okay? That's the engineering bit, that's the bit you're trying to shorten because it's the only bit you can control. You can't control the clinical trials. So the only way you get more revenue is by cutting that development slide down. I think years ago when we were talking about this, Dan and I would say that um, if you have a block, what's called a blockbuster therapeutic, so a blockbuster therapeutic turns over more than a billion dollars a year in revenue. If you have a blockbuster therapeutic, it costs your company $300 million a day for every day it takes you to develop your process. So if in the, and development 
phase is usually about two years. Okay, so if in the course of that two years you can shave three days off, the amount of money you can save is um, huge. Don't mean 300 million, I mean 3 million. My maths is failing me at this point. This is what engineering does to you. Um, still, 3 million is quite a lot of money. So, how can we do this quicker? This development bit, how can we do it much quicker? There are traditional tenets of scale-up in chemical engineering and process engineering whereby you take certain things and you move up through scale steps. Okay? But that's not fundamentally not going to cut it within this environment because it's not quick enough. Um, so you need to find ways uh, of getting from very small to very large scale very quickly. And the really difficult thing is that you haven't got very much material to work with because it's really expensive to make these drugs. So you can't just try things at really large scale and then go, ah, it didn't work, fine, we'll try something else. So we need to understand what it is that dictates the scale behavior as we move. Um, we need to understand what things are the most important um, as you go from lab scale stuff to really large process scale things. And we need to be able to predict ranges, not points, because manufacture doesn't work on, I can absolutely run under these conditions. You need to say you need to run between this condition and that condition, because the equipment is simply so large it can't run at a fixed thing, absolutely fixed thing. It needs to run in ranges, so you need to understand what the ranges are. So I'm going to give you uh, two examples from either end of my academic career, if you like, of things that we've been working on which are to do with understanding how to get something scaled up quickly. First is something called ultra scale down technology, which was um, coined, the, the phrase was coined at UCL uh, back in the early 2000s. Um, and it's a methodology that looks to predict the performance of very large scale pieces of equipment using only very tiny amounts of material. So the, uh, the thing on the right, many of you will recognize is an Eppendorf centrifuge, little lab centrifuge. The thing on the left is uh, what we call a shear device. So it's a, re a remote control car motor attached to a metal disc inside a chamber. And the purpose of that will become apparent as I uh, move on. Okay. I, uh, I'm obliged to put in this uh, um, XKCD cartoon every time I uh, talk about centrifugation. Um, so you can, you can pay attention to that while I'm talking, if you like. Um, the problem, centrifugation is a, an interesting example to work on. The problem with centrifugation is that it differs so much at small scale from process scale. Centrifugation is fundamentally the idea that you can take solids in a liquid and spin them, and they'll go out. In the same way that if, uh, if you have a... Um, uh, a, a glass of water and you drop some sand into it, the sand will sink in the water. That's, se that's sedimentation, separation of the basis of gravity. If we put in a more powerful acceleration than gravity, so centrifugal acceleration, and put the sand and the water in, we'd spin the sand out of the water quicker. So that's very helpful for us in biochemical engineering when we are trying to remove the cells from the system, because the cells were our factories and we don't want the factories anymore once they finish making things. We don't love them anymore, so we need to spin them out to get rid of them. So it's very, very common to have centrifugation in a proce manufacturing process. But that's a lab centrifuge. Many of you are familiar with a lab centrifuge. You put things into tubes, you spin it. That doesn't work. Process scale continuous centrifuge. This is a process scale continuous centrifuge. You feed the cells and the liquid in the top. The whole thing is spinning really, really quickly. The cells spin to the outside. You open gates. The cells fly out, close gates. Clean liquid comes out the top massive, massive difference between what's going on in there and what's going on in there, but yet the same separation force is acting. Now, previously, everybody scaled up centrifuges by something that's called sigma theory, which I'm not going to go into because it involves quite a lot of maths and is quite dull, but it doesn't really work because it doesn't allow for certain factors within the centrifuge. And what it doesn't allow for is that in your that little bucket centrifuge in the lab, your cells were in a calm environment. Yeah, they were being spun around really, really quickly, but they're just inside a tube. Um, so if we're thinking about how cells separate, um, I won't worry too much about uh, the, the, this graph, except to understand that. If I have a load of cells, they probably have an average size, but they probably won't be all exactly the same size. So let's say the average size is 10, 10 microns. That's the, the top of the little peak on that graph. 
they're probably going to range from maybe 7 microns to maybe 13 microns. So I set my centrifuge up, which is designed to separate particles, I set it up to take, a, to take everything which is bigger than, let's say, 7.5 microns out when it's spinning. And if I do that, I'm left with only this tiny little bit of particles which will carry over in my clarified liquid, in my clear liquid, and that's great. I've got, you know, I've removed 98% of my particles. That's perfect. And that's what happens in a lab centrifuge. But when we put it into an industrial centrifuge, commercial um, uh, process scale centrifuge, you have to accelerate the liquid with the cells in it inside the centrifuge. And you do that by dropping it down a central feed chamber, and it hits a metal lock nut at the bottom. That metal lock nut's spinning at about 10,000 re revolutions per minute in most large-scale centrifuges. So basically, the, the, the cells are being smacked with a spade that's traveling at 10,000 revs per minute. They don't like that very much, as it turns out, and a lot of them break. So what happens is this. Rather than this distribution of particles, you, cells you thought you were going to separate, 20% of the cells get smashed into little bits. So they're now down at four or five microns. And suddenly, your centrifuge that you've set up to remove 98% of the cells is probably only taking out 80% of them. And this is, was a problem for years in process scaling. They couldn't understand why their, their big centrifuges were so rubbish compared to their small ones. Um, so what we did was we ran a combination of computational fluid dynamic models on the inside of the centrifuges. So most of this work was done by um, a contemporary of Dan and ours at UCL called Mike Boychin, but the, uh, um, some of the later principles we then took and, and developed for other processes. The idea is that you model the inside of a, that's a commercial centrifuge, and then you model the inside of a very fast rotating disk, and you get the shear rates to match, that's the red sections. And if you get the shear rates to match, then what you can do is, you can take your cells and you can put them into that little, little disk device and smash them to bits as they would in a centrifuge. And then you can put them into a normal benchtop centrifuge and you'll get the same clarification. Right? Eh, maybe that might work. Um, uh, got one of our very lovely old photographs back from 2000 UCL. Um, so the idea is you generate a system which allows you to mimic the most important thing that matters in that large-scale centrifuge in a lab. Rather than trying to mimic everything about it, you look for the thing that matters the most. And what matters the most in big centrifuges, it turns out, is smashing cells to bits. Okay? Um, so, we'll try that. I've had to remove the numbers from this graph, and it's a horrible graph, I'm sorry, but um, it's a graph from uh, 2005 when uh, myself and one of the PhD students at UCL went to a company called Lonzo Biologics in the US who have a 20,000 litre manufacturing facility for monoclonal antibodies. It's one of the biggest monoclonal antibody facilities in the world, or it was at the time. And they wanted to see if we could help them predict how the, uh, uh, make their centrifuge work better. Um, I've taken the numbers off the bottom right hand side because um, they didn't particularly want people to know what the shear levels were inside their centrifuge. Um, so what we did was we took our device and we started to smash the cells up with the shear device. And then, and then in a little bench centrifuge, we clarified them and we looked for predictions. And without going into too much detail about what the, the axes signify, the one across the bottom, Q upon C sigma equivalence, is a is a measure of flow rate through a, through a, increasing flow rate through a centrifuge or increasing centrifuge size, centrifuge gets bigger. But in this case, it's increasing flow rate through a centrifuge, modeled, and then the solids remaining is, is self-explanatory. Then the higher that number, the more cells were carried over, therefore not clarified by the centrifuge. So the higher that number is, the, more, the worse the centrifuge is performing. And zero shear means we don't use our methodology. So if they went into the lab, Lonza, and they looked at their cells and they tried to predict what that centrifuge would do, they'd see the solids remaining going from 1% to about 2%, depending on the flow rate of the centrifuge. And then they ran their large-scale centrifuge and they got 10 to 12% solids. Uh, so what we did was smash the cells up more and more and more and more. Um, and the, the predicted shear level is the high shear. So the, predicted, the high shear is the predicted shear level that the, uh, the uh, CFD models predict should happen. Um, and it just tracks their data completely. So what's really important about this in terms of um, sort of translational aspect of, uh, of engineering research is that that was done with um, about three millilitres of their cell culture to perfectly predict how their 20,000 litre 
uh, fermenter would harvest, cell culture vessel would harvest. So um, for them, that was, a, that was quite a major step forward in terms of how this thing, sort of thing could be applied. Um, the other thing I want to talk about with this is in terms of control, which is um, something that goes sort of hand in hand with uh, this kind of scale, which is um, uh, modeling what we call unit operation windows. So again, this is a relatively old idea from, from quite a few years ago, but still quite a nice idea which is that we want to understand, we want to visualize how we can, when we, when we have this data from understanding how centrifuges scale up, we want to understand how they can be operated. So we start off with the properties of the centrifuge itself. So if we have a centrifuge, and um, sigma in this is just a measure of centrifuge size, so small centrifuge going up to big centrifuge on the right. We can look at that centrifuge, and it will have limits as to how fast. It's a continuous centrifuge, so you flow liquid through it has limits to how fast you can put liquid through. The high-end limits will be simply down to the fact that that's how big the centrifuge is. The low-end limits are, if you go any slower than that, everything in the centrifuge overheats, because most of them cool with the flow of liquid through them. So those limits are just constrained by the centrifuge itself. Then we add on our criteria based on the idea that we'll model, we'll shear the cells, we'll model their separation, we'll say we must have no more than 2% cells carried over into the supernatant for the rest of the process for making the drug lay that on, and then you get a blue area which shows where both coincide, and that, in that area you can operate. So if you, if you know how big your centrifuge is, you can read up there, and you can see what the maximum and minimum flow rates you could use that centrifuge and still get the criteria you need. But what's more important about this is how we can use it for robustness. Remember I said that things have to work in ranges? Okay, it can't just be a fixed point. So on this curve, the green point will be absolutely great. It's right in the middle, bang in the middle of the blue area. So if you get some variance one way or the other, it's still going to work. Red point, quite dodgy. It's right on the outskirts. So if you get some variance in your process, it may not work. You may not meet the criteria. And there's a whole um, series of sort of QAQC stuff about how much variance you can have in your process and still make it work. It's very important to, to understand these sort of things. So... That's the right at the start of the stuff, I suppose I did, thing. This is right at the end of the stuff. Well, hopefully not the end. It depends how this goes, I guess. But um, uh, what, what I've been doing for the last few years, I guess, and what my research group's been doing for the last few years. And this is moving from traditional biotherapeutics, which are usually proteins, so they're usually proteins made by the introduction of human DNA into other cells, moving into more complicated targets. So what I want to talk about is scale-up of what we call cellular therapies. So again, I put the Wikipedia direct definition in because, you know, you might as well. Um, I spend my life telling people not to use Wikipedia, so I might as well put it in my presentations. Um, cell therapy is a therapy which cellular material is injected into a patient. Unless you uh, subscribe to some of the more um, slightly insane types of alternative medicine, that usually means intact living cells um, and in usually intact living human cells. Um, there are some more interesting alternative strains of medicine which involve injecting horse cells into people. Anyway, um, the, By far the most well-known cell therapy is bone marrow transplant. That's been around for quite a while now. Um, but there's a phenomenal amount of promise in cellular therapies in terms of what they may be capable of achieving. Um, particularly if you start to move um, from what is known as autologous cell therapy to, allergen to what's called allogeneic cell therapy. So an autologous cell therapy is where uh, someone would take your cells, your own stem cells from inside you, and they would drive them to become a certain type of cell and then transplant them back into you, um, usually known as autologous or one donor, one recipient. There are, some, there are arguably some types of or close to autologous therapies which are more than one recipient. Um, Fiona may, uh, may argue with me about what the true definition of autologous is, but in general, the key thing about autologous is that you need the patient's cells to start developing the treatment. There's two things with that. One is that the patient, that requires the patient to have the right stem, the right cells, which may or may not be the case, but more critically, there is a time delay in it. So you take cells out of somebody, um, you grow them up, you purify them, you put them back in again. That's not an instantaneous or even very rapid sort of therapy. 
and with a lot of the therapies that are being driven, particularly with ambitions of, say, uh, repairing, uh, repairing heart muscle after a massive heart attack, you are not going to have that level of time. You're not going to be able to buy the six weeks it takes you to, to grow the cells up. Allogeneic cell therapy is the idea that you take cells from a donor or from some other source, and you grow them up, and you separate them out, and you transplant them into anybody you like. That's considerably more challenging, as probably you can imagine. There's a lot of stuff about this that I'm not even going to touch on today, which is quite difficult. Particularly, there are um, regulatory issues. Particularly, there are immunorejection issues. If I take cells from you, grow them up, and put them back in you, you're not going to reject them because they're your cells, and your body will recognize them. If I take cells from somebody and put them into somebody else, there is a very, very, very high chance their body will reject them. Probably one of the few. Um, uh, it's not. It's not an exception to that. Um, Blood transfusions, we avoid rejection by making sure we match blood type properly. But there are very, very few cells that are as simple as blood cells in terms of how they uh, trigger immune responses. But from my point of view, I'm an engineer, so I look at autologous processes and I go, they're great, it's brilliant science, absolutely mind-blowing some of the stuff that's going on. There's not much I can do to help there. Um, but allogeneic, yeah, maybe, because this is about the same sort of challenge. It's about how do we start making these things at larger scale. So what's the, what's the scale-up need? What's the manufacturing need for cell therapies? The way that cell therapy works, in most cases, in the simplest case, you just take cells from one person, so bone marrow, you take cells from one person, put them into somebody else. You don't do much to them. You might, you might clarify them a little bit, try it, but there's not much going on there. For a large-scale allogeneic cell therapy, what you would do is you would take a starting cell. That starting cell might be um, uh, what we call a pluripotent stem cell. So if you've heard of human embryonic stem cells, human em embryonic stem cells are pluripotent cells. They are capable of being any, turning themselves into any cell in the human body. We kind of regard them as universal template cells. The only cells they can't turn themselves into are gametes, eggs and sperm, because that's what they came from. Um, or we might take what's called a multipotent cell, which is a cell which has, is one stage further on, and it's chosen what it's going to be um, in terms of the three categories of, of, uh, of cells in the body, which are loosely uh, inside, outside, and, and middle, really. Um, more or less what the names mean. Um, uh, mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm, they are just inside, outside, and middle. Right? They, they are slightly more specific about what they become, but that's basically what we're talking about. Once they've specified that, they can then become any cell which is down that line, but they can't go backwards. It's like a one-way maze. Okay? Every time they make a decision and change cell type, they cannot go back again. So the further down that you go, the less wide range you have in, in, the, in the choice you make, but um, uh, the more specified the cell is. If we want to manufacture um, cells through differentiation, which is what that process is called, the cell changing, um, then we're going to have to take these cells, we're going to have to make them change, and we're going to have to make them divide and produce lots more cells. So we want to start off with a few cells of, that could be anything, and we want to end up with loads of cells that are one thing. So we might want to start off with, given I talk about this quite a lot in the last bit of this talk, we might want to start off with one pluripotent human embryonic stem cell and end up with, well, you probably can't start with one, but a couple, end up with millions of red blood cells. So we need them to differentiate, we need them to expand, which is when they um, divide and grow up. Nobody can differentiate anything to 100% efficiency. So you cannot take cells and end up with 100% red blood cells. Some of the best biologists are getting high numbers, 80%, 90%, but nobody can get to 100%. So you're always going to have some cells in there which aren't what you wanted them to be. So you're going to have to worry about that. You have to do something about that. The other challenge you need to look at is that you need to um, understand the, uh, the scale-up challenges of making lots of these cells. And that almost always means moving into what's called suspension culture. So suspension culture means growing the cells floating free in liquid. Most people grow stem cells on surfaces, attached culture, because they like it better. They like being close to their mates. They understand. They communicate with each other in ways that um, I'm sure there are people in this audience that understand, but I don't. Um, but it's very difficult to grow things on surfaces at large scales because you need a lot of surface. Yeah? So what you want them to do is grow in suspension where you can pack them all tightly together. You need to understand how the environment changes for the cell and how that's going to make everything quite difficult. 
then when you've done that, you need to go back to your first problem, which is that all the cells aren't the cells you wanted them to be, and therefore that means you're going to have to purify them. And right now, that is considered one of the really major bottlenecks in manufacturing cell therapies, because there are techniques for separating cells of different types, but they're all really, really hard to scale. In fact, I would argue they're all pretty much impossible to scale beyond a certain size. So, we need to consider how we're going to handle the, uh, the understanding of the environment for growing them and how we're going to do something completely radical to be able to purify them. And the last point is quite interesting. The two gold standard purification things uh, for cell therapies right now are known as FACS and MAX, fluorescence activated cell sorting and magnetically activated cell sorting. And they both involve sticking something to the outside of the cell so that it's easier to recognize by the system. And the problem with that is that you've then got something stuck to your cell. And that's probably not ideal if you're going to put it into people. There are plenty of therapies that have been made using facts and gone into people, but there's mostly because there's no alternative. The idea of having, an, it's usually an antibody or an, what's called an antigen, the idea of an antibody or antigen labeled cell inside a person is, um, so, uh, it's not ideal. It's really not ideal. So if you can find someone which doesn't stick something on the cells, that'd be lovely. Um, it's against the law to not to do any of these kind of talks without having a fax plot in there, which is um, those, those graphs at the top. Um, uh, but luckily, I'm not a biologist, so I only explain them in the broadest of terms. Um, this is the process for turning pluripotent or multipotent, so say human embryonic stem cell, into a red blood cell. 21-ish, 21 to 30 day differentiation process. So you've got to have these cells and grow them for that length of time. And all through that period, you've got to give them the right cues to make them change to be the right type of cells. Start off pluripotent or multipotent, and they go through something called erythropoiesis, which I can never say. Um, and then the last critical bit is that they shed their nucleus. They lose all their genetic material, um, all, their, all their chromosomal genetic material. Um, and they become what's called an erythrocyte. And then in the body, but very, very, very rarely outside of the body, they then flip to become that biconcave disc that you would recognize as a, as a picture of a red blood cell. It's actually quite hard to do that in, in the lab, but it turns out it doesn't really matter whether they flipped or not. Once you put them into the body, they flip. So you don't need to manufacture them flipped, but you do need to get rid of the nucleus because you made that from a pluripotent stem cell. So you made that with somebody else's DNA. And it's not really a great idea to put somebody else's DNA into you for a number of reasons, if you can possibly avoid it. Um, what these plots show is um, CD35, CD235A is a marker for a cell being an erythrocyte, or that type of cell. And uh, DRAC-Q is a marker for DNA. So if the cell has DNA in it, it's going to be to the right of the plot. And if the screen turns off, then... Uh, that's interesting. Oh, it's gone back. Didn't, didn't like my explanation, obviously. Um, and if the cell is to the top of the plot, it's becoming a red blood cell. So you can see them starting off uh, day one, not a very high uh, uh, population of CD235s. The reason there's any CD235s is because this experiment wasn't done with a pluripotent cell. It was done with uh, what's called a hematopoietic progenitor, which is a, a multipotent cell that's capable of being any blood cell, but not anything else. Um, it's, frankly, a complete pain to work with human embryonic stem cells, so we try and start from somewhere down the process when we try and do this. Um, uh, so you see, as they move on, they're all moving towards the top, so they're all becoming erythrocytes. They're all becoming red blood cells. But you'll see that around day 18, you start to get this um, split off, significant split off of cells that have lost their nucleus, so they're not showing as DNA anymore. So right towards the end, you've got a split of population. Some of them uh, have a nucleus, some of them don't. So we've got, the numbers are a bit hard to see, but you've gone from sort of about 7% without a nucleus on day 14 to 62% without a nucleus on day 21. So they've lost their nucleus, which is what we want them to do, but not all of them have. So that's going to be a problem, because we can't put the ones that have got nuclei into humans, but we can put the ones that haven't got nuclei into humans. So, yeah. I'll talk about a couple of the challenges we've done with this. One is to do with, I don't know, I've got a clicker. Uh, one is to do with um, how we scale the cell culture. So how we understand moving into large-scale culture, large-scale suspension culture. So um, 
We need to understand the environment the cells are in. Um, they, under normal circumstances, if this is happening in a human body, there's all sorts of things that they may be exposed to, but one of the things they're not going to be exposed to is being put in a tank and stirred, unless there's something really odd going on in your body. You're not going to be stirring cells in a tank inside it. But that's pretty much the only way we can make these things in the numbers that we need to make them. So we need to look, and again, these are some uh, CFD models that a postdoc of, of mine did um, a little while ago as part of um, a PhD that finished a couple of years ago. Um, looking at producing a, a device which would allow us to um, generate the same sort of levels of shear as we got inside a specific mammalian cell culture vessel. I couldn't use the spinny shear device from before because they belong to UCL and that would be stealing. Um, but also because the shear levels in these reactors are much lower than the shear levels in centrifuges. So we looked at a different way of doing it using variation in channel width. So you can see you still get the same red areas. Um, so we looked at trying to understand the mixing. We looked at trying to understand how the cells would cope with that. Um, we looked at how they start to look at how they would understand uh, how, how they would cope with um, levels of metabolites, levels of nutrients. As you move from different cultures, that uh, different types of cell growing things, that that changes a lot. So the nutrients are the things they need. The metabolites are what they put out. Metabolites are generally can be poisonous to cells. So you want to look at the levels, make sure everything's going the way it can. So we've got a just an example of a plot for glutamate, which is a metabolite at the bottom there. The other thing we started to look at is oxygen. I mean, cells need oxygen. They need to respire in the same as um, anything living does. Um, but most small-scale cell growth is done in little flasks or in dishes where all the oxygen just moves through the surface, absorbs through the surface, and comes in. When you get really big tanks, it doesn't have a very big surface, so it's very hard to get oxygen in that way. So you usually have to do it by bubbling oxygen through, but that's a completely different environment. Again, if any of you have got um, some sort of oxygen system bubbling into your bloodstream, there's something quite wrong going on, I would have thought. So it's not something that the cells are going to be in any way used to, but it's the only way we're going to be able to get oxygen to them. So can we understand how, how we, that affects their growth? The other thing that is really important in cell therapy growth, uh, development is the length of time and the changes that go on. Remember I said 21 to 30 days, they've got to be growing in culture? During that point period, they're changing from one type of cell to another. That doesn't really happen in any other biotherapeutic manufacturing process. Do we actually understand that their, their needs are the same all the way through? Clearly, they probably aren't. As they go from one type of cell to another, their needs probably change. So. A um, PhD student of mine, Nicola, um, she uh, developed a, a device for flowing, uh, flowing media over cells with uh, oxygen set, little tiny ox micro-oxygen sensors in um, using a fluorescent dye. And that allowed her to look at, as the cells changed, how much oxygen did they need? Generally, we, we assume that most cells are quite happy in ambient oxygen, 21% oxygen. But it turns out, in red blood cells, when you get to day 20, day 24, they are vastly happier being hypoxic. So you, take, you give them a very little amount of oxygen. Now, um, we did this probably the wrong way around, in that we did this, and then we went to talk to biologists about why that might be. And they explained, and we went, oh, yeah, we should probably have talked to you first. Um, but that's kind of the thing about engineering. You do sort of trying to get off and do things. But... Um, the fact about this, again, is that we could track this with a very, very, very small number of cells. It's quite difficult to do these kind of experiments with very small numbers of cells. Um, there, is a, um, there is a piece of equipment which is sort of the holy grail of anybody that works in this kind of field called an AMBA, which is a multi-small bioreactor system, um, but they cost an absolute fortune. You need to be at UCL or Loughborough to have one of those. So um, the problem with them mostly is they, uh, it's not so much the cost of the equipment, it's the cost of the consumables. To do a run in an amber can cost you um, 15,000, 20,000 pounds. And trying to explain to a grant funding body that every time you do an experiment, it's going to cost 15,000 pounds can be quite difficult, um, especially when you can have a PhD student take three years to do it. So um, the other thing I would talk about, which is more... Um, linking through to, to, to where I started, which was downstream processing, purification of things, is how we face the challenges of purification of cells. So here we've got some quite interesting concerns. 
the complexity of your target cell that you're trying to purify here is many orders of magnitude higher than most traditional bioproducts. A protein is pretty complicated, but a cell, that's quite seriously complicated. Um, it could be really quite hard to define a cell. If you want to define a protein, if you want to really analytically define a protein, you probably can. You can do X-ray crystallography on it. You can do amino acid sequences, so on, so forth, structural analysis. It's quite difficult to do that with a cell because cells vary. You know, one, one red blood cell is not exactly the same as the other. Um, unlike trying to purify um, a protein product, the cells that you want are most of the cells that are there. So the things you're trying to get rid of are in the minority. Usually when you're trying to purify a protein, the things that you want to get rid of are in the majority. Now that might sound like it makes it easier because there's more of the stuff you want. But actually, the problem is you've no idea how few of the things that you don't want you can get away with. If I made red blood cells from human embryonic stem cells and I made a million red blood cells and you'd need two... Uh, you need two times 10 to the 12 cells for a unit of blood. So, yeah, two million million cells for a unit of blood. How many of those cells? If I made that from human embryonics and there were some left in the human embryonics left at the end, how many human embryonics would be okay? Nobody really has any handle on that. It's possible that one might be too many. One might. If, if, I, if I took a human embryonic stem cell and I, or a load of human embryonic cell cells and I put them into your bloodstream, the chances are they may form something which is called a teratoma, which is a benign... Um, cancerous growth, although it's not cancerous, benign cell growth. Um, it's not really great. So how many human embryos can you get away with? Nobody really knows, but if, you've got a, if, you, can, if you can't have one out of two million million, then that's a hell of a purification technique you're going to have to get to remove that one. Um, the, the things that are contaminating, it will all be completely different. They'll be all the way through that process from human embryonic to, or, or multipotent progenitor to, to red blood cell. Um, and the scales involved will dwarf anything that's commercially available. So most of the commercially available cell separation techniques can handle quickly and regularly, can handle 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 cells. So that's not even one unit of blood. That's not even a hundredth of one unit of blood. So you need something completely different. So our pro approach has always been to, to ignore the biological characteristics of the cells to some degree and try and exploit the physical characteristics of the cells. The idea, you take a flow of cells, you apply some kind of separation force based on the physical properties, and you get a flow of separated cells out. And the thing that we started looking at probably about four or five years ago is the idea that if you have... that cells are squashy, but some cells are squashier than others. And if we can take that and ex use that to exploit a separation tool, and there are a couple of ways, well, it's actually several ways you can do it, but there's a couple of ways that we've approached doing this. First way is the idea that softer cells, cells that can be more easily squashed and can be reversibly deformed, can maybe be separated if we force them through narrow channels. So in other words, we generate channels which are narrower than the cells, which the squashy cells will squash and go through, and the non-squashy cells won't go through. To do that, we need to understand how squashy cells are. Um, and again, in the grand scheme of should have asked somebody or the right person the right question a long time ago, the way we set out to do this is using something called an atomic force microscope, uh, which is an immensely complicated piece of kit, um, which basically just pokes the surface of things very, very, very quickly or drags across the surface of things. Um, Atomic force microscopes were um, uh, developed for producing uh, topographical, so 3D maps of very, very, very far, small features on surfaces. Um, but we have one that works um, under liquid and at 37 degrees and that you can put um, gases into so that it can, it can analyse cells, it can analyse living biological structures. And we've used it for quite a lot of stuff. Um, but um, using it for this is probably like going and getting a battleship gun to open a door, but it does do it. Um, and what we did was we get an image of the cell using a normal microscope, we lay a grid over it, and every square of that green grid is, an, is where the AFM needle goes in and pokes the cell, and it tests basically how, far, how hard the cell pushes back. And on this map, red is stiff and blue is soft. And what we did was we used that to map, cell, map cells' elastic modulus. It's a very, very effective technique, really effective technique. It just takes a long time. 
Um, so we did that, and we mapped red blood cells, and we mapped nucleate cells, and we mapped inucleate cells, so we nucleated without a nucleus in, and we mapped a mix, right? <coughs> and you can see there's a difference in the elastic modulus, how soft they are. So high elastic modulus means it's stiffer. So the cells that have a nucleus in are stiffer than the cells that don't have a nucleus in. That's, again, makes sense from a biological point of view. A nucleus is quite a stiff feature. So if you take it out of the cell, the cell's going to be more squashy. It's like having a, um, a balloon filled with water with a, with a cricket ball inside almost. If you take the cricket ball out, it's going to be a lot squashier. So that, that, was, that was great. That was what we thought. So we just wanted a, a way of separating cells through narrow channels to test, to test if this narrow channel method would work. Narrow channels just a filter, really. A lot of people have done this with, and actually manufactured a load of narrow channels, but that um, seemed a bit, because uh, it would be a diff difficult to scale, I thought. So I went to see if I could find some filters which had very, very, very specific hole sizes in them. Found some things called cell sieves, um, and we built a, uh, a, a 3D printed device mimicking the sort of channels you get inside a, uh, just a commercial filter. Um, sandwich the cell sieves in there, ran cells through the system, try and see if we could separate them. So in this case, the cell, these cells are of the order of um, 8 to 10 microns in diameter, so the cell sieve we ran was 5 microns in diameter, so the cells would have to deform to go through it. Um, stepping away from blood for a second, the, the, most of the work we did with this was um, with osteoblastic cells, so bone cells. So we took some human embryonic stem cells at day one, and we gave them the right signals to become bone cells, to become osteoblasts, so the cells that, that form your skeletal structure. Um, and the wells, the little sort of wells with different colours in, you can see on the right-hand side, are cells from each day, day one, day six, day 11, day 15, day 21, stained with what's called alizarin in red. And alizarin in red picks up um, the, uh, uh, the sort of calcified structure around the outside of bone cells as bones form. So you can see them becoming more and more like bones. And you can see that their stiffness is changing, but it's not... The reason I put this up rather than blood is that it's really quite unpredictable and they have different... You know, they're, they're, you're seeing different um, uh, types of uh, stiffness even on, on the same day. So on day 11, you've got two distinct populations. And then what we did was we took a, a median elastic modulus and plotted it against relative enrichment. So that's how much better we are getting them uh, pure, how much more concentrated we're getting them by passing them through our device. Okay, so you see the two things track each other as the, uh, as the uh, elastic modulus gets higher, the level of separation gets higher, so the elastic modulus gets lower, the level of separation gets lower. And that's because the human embryonic cells that we're trying to separate them from are quite soft. So if they're soft, we can't separate them. If they're stiff, we can. So, that was great, but 30, 40% enrichment in a pass is not brilliant. You'd have to pass it through loads and loads of times to get the kind of purities you'd need, but it might be quite useful as an early stage separation technique. And now I come back to the point about not asking the right people the right questions five years ago. Um, there's a group uh, in Germany, uh, with a guy called Oliver Otto, who was uh, simultaneously developing something called a real-time deform deformability cytometer. I wouldn't worry too much about the technicalities of what it does, but basically it does what our AFM does, looking at the elastic modular cells, but it can do hundreds of cells per second. Depends on how fast the camera is. But certainly hundreds of cells per minute is not a problem. So we were spending uh, a day analyzing 10 cells, and then they can go and bang these cells through. The other thing about this is that um, this analyzes them in liquid, in their natural environment, whereas we were analyzing them on a surface. Um, the, the presence of this group was, um, was pointed out to me by um, uh, a dangerously bright PhD student that Helen Bridle and I have. Um, and she secured herself some money to go and work with their group. And in fact, she's over there at the moment. Um, and what she did is she put enucleated red blood cells without a nucleus, cells with a nucleus, and the nucleus themselves into the cytometer. And, you can sort of see the difference in the image. You can see this enucleated cell. Without the nucleus, it stretches much more because it's, um, not got the, it's not got the stiff nucleus in it. And it's being pushed through this channel really fast, and it stretches out against the flow of liquid. And if we look at the, uh, 
different day, the day stages here. So day 11, when they aren't red blood cells, you can see they're all in one group and a certain size and a certain level of deformation. But as you go forward, we start to see this big high up group where it's still the same size, but they're deforming much more. And we also start to see this really small group at the bottom where they're much smaller and much stiffer. And that's the nucleus and that's the enucleated cells. Um, so this, is, this, this technique is working to be able to analyze and show that the cells are the same, uh, the, the, they have this variation in stiffness. So you can see the same thing here. Um, the cells with a nucleus in, they don't deform very much. The cells without a nucleus, they do deform a lot. Um, so they're much softer. But there's not a massive difference in size. And it was always assumed there probably would be a significant difference in size when they lose the nucleus, but it turns out there isn't really, which means that size isn't the greatest tool for separating them, but squashiness might be. So how are we going to do that? Well, Helen and I discussed this. Helen has already been working for quite some time on uh, something called inertial focusing. Um, and again, I'm going to stay away from the maths, mostly because there's certain parts of the maths of that that I don't think I properly understand. But the idea is that if you fire things down a channel really quickly, you get a balance between the forces inside the channel will cause the cells to, or the, 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 the things you put down the channel, to position themselves in the channel depending on their size. Which is fine, but we've already just said we can't separate them on the basis of size because they're quite similar in size. But the key thing about this is you're firing them down the channel so fast that if they're squashy, they stretch out. So their apparent size becomes much smaller. So maybe we can separate them like that. And yeah, you can. You put uh, nucleated cells, nucleated cells, and nuclei into one of Helen's devices and fire them around the whole thing. And distance from the outer wall is obviously the position within the channel. And once you put them in different positions, all you have to do is take, uh, take pipes, if you like, off the end of the channel at different points, and you can separate them out. So we've got almost completely clear separation in the main body of the population between enucleated cells in pink and nucleated cells in purple. So we're kind of moving on now to try this at larger and larger scale um, to try and demonstrate that we can get high levels of, of separation. This, the paper for this was out about a month ago. So um, this really is from stuff right at the start to right at the end of what we've been doing. So. I'm done now, I've only gone a couple of minutes over. Probably not even that much over, actually, because we're in the introduction. Um, I'm going to finish with some thoughts about particularly the difference between more complicated cellular therapies and traditional um, uh, protein therapies. Um, yes, cellular targets are massively more complex than proteins, but it's really important we learn lessons from an awful lot of stuff that happened in the past in industry and in academia in the manufacture of biotherapeutics. I'm thinking of some of the lessons from monoclonal antibody development, where 30 or so years ago, everybody swore blind that you wouldn't be able to grow the Chinese hamster ovary cells that you need to make, use to make monoclonal antibodies. You wouldn't be able to grow those in suspension. They'd always have to grow on surfaces. And that turned out to be untrue. And then people said you wouldn't be able to get cell densities, the number of cells in the vessel, up beyond a certain amount. You wouldn't be able to get expression levels of the amount of protein you make beyond certain amounts. And yet, that all happened. And now people in the cellular therapy world are going, nah, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never get those cells off surfaces. They'll always have to grow on surfaces. But that's not been the case with other things. It's important that we learn about that. Um, it's pretty clear that you need new approaches, new ideas, new unit operations um, to work with cells, because they're not like anything that we've ever developed processes for before. But the, all the knowledge from biochemical engineering does apply widely. The principles are still the same. It's about process design. It's about unit operations and know-how is transferable. Um, but the thing I've learned more than anything else in the last 20 years is that um, if you don't collaborate with people in other disciplines, then you are, you are basically screwed. Because there's no... Uh, people get stuck in narrow knowledge fields. And there's... Um, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do uh, probably 90% of the stuff I'd done without having people in other fields who know vastly more than me about things who are hugely skilled in certain areas. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to get anywhere with any of this kind of stuff. Um, and this is just, you know, one area. There's been all sorts of other stuff that our research group has done in all sorts of, we said, in all sorts of areas. 
whiskey, algae, all those kind of things by finding somebody that knows a lot about something and going and talking to them um, and asking them stupid questions. Um, it's the way to go. Is he, I, I'm not going to go through these because um, I've already spotted this one person, Alan, that I'd, I forgot to put on this list. I knew I would because there's so many names. <laughs> so Alan Harper should be on this list. I, Tony's not on it either. I just spotted. So these are basically, this is basically, every, as far as I can remember, everybody that I've collaborated with. But actually, um, the acknowledgements I'd like to give, um, I'd like to give big acknowledgement to um, UCL's biochemical engineering department because... Uh, particularly Mike and Nigel at the top were, were the people that, that got me into this kind of thing. I, I went there to do chemical engineering and changed my mind very quickly after a couple of conversations with Nigel. Um, uh, and the school at Harriet Watt, but particularly the ones that never get any kind of acknowledgement of this, um, the undergrad and MSc students, because actually a large number of these ideas came out of undergrad research projects. The undergrad research projects may have not got very far and they may not have felt that they achieved that much, but the ideas that come out of those projects go on to become something else. Um, and also, um, the administrators, in case they come and hunt me down now, um, uh, nothing, uh, most of you have an idea what academics were like, are like, or nothing will get done without the administrators. Final people I'd like to thank um, are the Industrial Biotech Innovation Centre, who have been around for about two or three years now in Scotland, because I think they have pretty much revolutionised the way that academia and industry interact. And hopefully, if more things can, can build in that kind of way, then we will get more useful collaborative research between academia and industry. Um, yeah. Uh, most of those people might have given me money, I guess. Um, uh, I'll not go through all of those. And finally, I should probably acknowledge the um, fact that um, while, seriously, being an academic is probably one of the best jobs in the world, still doesn't beat uh, when your three-year-old boy goes, um, so when I grow up, I want to be a structural engineer. <laughs> but, but first, I want to be a triceratops. <laughs> and when, in fact, that you discover that your four-year-old daughter has got absolutely spot-on Happy Mondays dancing technique. Uh, okay, thanks very much for your time.